So I'm fascinated by the extent to which our environment molds and shapes us. How what is without becomes within. And so I recently discovered this, uh, this term called ontological designing, which is essentially this notion that everything that we design is designing us back. We, we, from inside out, we are designed by that which we have designed. So there's this circularity, this meaning-making circle, this hermeneutic circle. You know, we're like the Ouroboros, you know, we're like the snake eating its own tail. We're like Escher's hands, you know, the hand that's drawing, the hand that is drawing it. You know, these feedback loops are where mind emerges. And it turns out that mind, that really subjectivity, who we are, you know, as life beings in the world, exists in that feedback loop, emerges in that feedback loop. You know, we learn language, but then that language molds our personalities, and then our molded personalities use language to speak out, and then that which we speak and read in turn changes us, and there's this circularity, right? So Marshall McLuhan used to talk about the role of technology in this space, in this context. So we build the tools, but then those tools build us. We build these smartphones, and then these smartphones change how we think, and they change our behavior. That's why, that's why they used to say that the PC, the computer, was the LSD of the 90s because the computer revolution literalized the dream of expanding our minds through the use of our feedback with these tools and these computers. Steven Johnson takes it further. He talks about architecture. He says our thoughts shape our spaces. We design the world, but those spaces return the favor. So we build these cathedrals, and then those cathedrals build cathedrals inside our minds, essentially. You know, we, we mirror the environment that we create. So what is our responsibility then when we build the cities of the 21st century, the city planners, the, the urban designers? How do we make better systems thinking, better feedback loops to kind of like upgrade <laughs> how we function in the world, you know, to, to upgrade mankind, to understand the city as an organism. And as, as Jeffrey West says from the Santa Fe Institute, you know, cities are like organisms, alleys are like capillaries. And so understanding these feedback loops, observing these feedback loops, upgrading these feedback loops allows us to raise the stage in which we unfold. And that's why ontological designing is an important idea. Testing, testing, one, two, three. When your band is trying to perform, feedback is an annoying obstacle. But in the grand orchestra of nature, feedback is not only beneficial, it's what makes everything work. What exactly is feedback? The key element, whether in sound, the environment, or social science, is a phenomenon called mutual causal interaction, where X affects Y, Y affects X, and so on, creating an ongoing process called a feedback loop. And the natural world is full of these mechanisms, formed by the links between living and non-living things, that build resilience by governing the way populations and food webs respond to events. When plants die, the dead material enriches the soil with hummus, a stable mass of organic matter, providing moisture and nutrients for other plants to grow. The more plants grow and die, the more hummus is produced, allowing even more plants to grow, and so on. This is an example of positive feedback, an essential force in the buildup of ecosystems. But it's not called positive feedback because it's beneficial. Rather, it is positive because it amplifies a particular effect or change from previous conditions. These positive or amplifying loops can also be harmful, like when removing a forest makes it vulnerable to erosion, which removes organic matter and nutrients from the earth, leaving less plants to anchor the soil and leading to more erosion. In contrast, negative feedback diminishes or counteracts changes in an ecosystem to maintain a more stable balance. Consider predators and their prey. When lynx eat snowshoe hares, they reduce their population. But this drop in the lynx's food source will soon cause their own population to decline, reducing the predation rate and allowing the hare population to increase again. The ongoing cycle creates an up-and-down, wave-like pattern, maintaining a long-term equilibrium and allowing a food chain to persist over time. Feedback processes might seem counterintuitive because many of us are used to more predictable linear scenarios of cause and effect. For instance, 
It seems simple enough that spraying pesticides would help plants grow by killing pest insects, but it may trigger a host of other unexpected reactions. For example, if spraying pushes down the insect population, its predators will have less food. As their population dips, the reduced predation would allow the insect population to rise, counteracting the effects of our pesticides. Note that each feedback is the product of the links in the loop. Add one negative link, and it will reverse the feedback force entirely. And one weak link will reduce the effect of the entire feedback considerably. Lose a link, and the whole loop is broken. But this is only a simple example, since natural communities consist not of separate food chains, but networks of interactions. Feedback loops will often be indirect, occurring through longer chains. A food web containing 20 populations can generate thousands of loops of up to 20 links in length. But instead of forming a disordered cacophony, feedback loops in ecological systems play together, creating regular patterns just like multiple instruments coming together to create a complex but harmonious piece of music. Wide-ranging negative feedbacks keep the positive feedbacks in check, like drums maintaining a rhythm. You can look at the way a particular ecosystem functions within its unique habitat as representing its trademark sound. Ocean environments, dominated by predator-prey interactions and strong negative and positive loops stabilized by self-damping feedback, are powerful and loud, with many oscillations. Desert ecosystems, where the turnover of biomass is slow and the weak feedbacks loop through dead matter, are more like a constant drone. And the tropical rainforest, with its great diversity of species, high nutrient turnover, and strong feedbacks among both living and dead matter, is like a lush panoply of sounds. Despite their stabilizing effects, many of these habitats and their ecosystems develop and change over time, as do the harmonies they create. Deforestation may turn lush tropics into a barren patch, like a successful ensemble breaking up after losing its star performers but an abandoned patch of farmland may also become a forest over time, like a garage band growing into a magnificent orchestra. Hi there. I hope you enjoyed watching those two videos on feedback loops. So today's Breakthrough Awakening episode is on the power of feedback loops. And really the idea that not only is it true that your outer world reflects your inner world, it's also true that your inner world reflects your outer world. So I feel that in conjunction with our personal growth work, such as deprogramming ourselves from the negative programming and limiting beliefs that came from our childhood, really, healing our childhood wounds and diving into our shadow, that inner personal growth work, we must also do the outer work of changing the environment that we live in. Like Jason Silver said, letting the design of our environment affect us. And that's what I mean by installing feedback loops. For example, what I did was create vision boards that represent the way I want to feel. For example, this vision board right here, this particular picture that you see behind me, represents me feeling centered. It represents that core desired feelings. There are other vision boards that I have on my walls that don't have things as my goals. It doesn't have cars, for example. It just represents the pictures just represent the feelings I want to feel. So let me show you an example right there and right there. So you can clearly see with these pictures that it's all about how I want to feel. The pictures, the vision boards have a totally different vibe from the, from the traditional vision board. 
I also changed the design of my room according to Feng Shui principles with everything in its proper place so that it enlarges and expands nine different areas of my life. So that everything related to wealth, for example, is in its wealth corner. Everything related to relationships is in its relationship corner. And that feedback that I see every day affects the way I feel inside. Same thing with being judicious about the friends that I spend time with, the loved ones and the lovers that I choose. All of it affects my inner world. So it's not just about changing my inner world, it's about changing my outer world and creating that feedback loop, installing powerful systems, habits, and feedback loops that change my life. Thank you so much for watching. This has been an episode of Breakthrough Awakening. Subscribe to my channel, subscribe to my website at blissgasms.com. Thank you so much.